have the language of music in common, and we know how to play off each other. And some of that synergy is really hard to come by. And once you find that, you grasp onto it and you hold onto it for as long as you can. I think you have to get along with each other in order to do it for this long. No one lives in their house with their friends all the time. Not even a house. No one lives in a room with their friends all the time. Ah, you guys are with? Hey, you Hey, Yeah! Hey, man! We're gonna survive! Yeah. Uh, survive! Uh, right, let's go get him! <laughs> oh, man, that's specific image or look we're just like let's just go have a good time we we'll look like guys having a good time <laughs> that's what we want to look like so as long as that's always part of what we do i think everybody will stay happy and hopefully people will stay interested yeah. we've been given this incredible chance to be able to be a band for as long as we have we've done the most insane things ever it's awesome we've gone around the world literally i'm not taking it for granted at all ever it's always a dream come true to be able to tour and play music for a living it's the best. Since we started this band, back in 1999, 2000, we're all about unity, about including every single one into our music. Whether you're a metalhead, a punk rocker, a skinhead, a headbanger, whoever you are, you're our family here in metal. Thanks for so much for being here, for supporting this band for all these years, and for representing for metal. Being around for 16 years is pretty insane, especially when I look back on how we started, but I think it's a testament to the band's passion and the fans' loyalty. There's a bunch of photos here from back in the day when we first started. These are really cool, actually, for more than one reason. One, because I'm still pretty skinny, which is awesome. Two, look at Adam D's face in that photo. It's so intense. He's like the bleach blonde demon in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of different looks for sure. I have dreadlocks in this. Jesse's got short hair. Joel's got long hair. And Adam just has a lot of yellow hair. Me and Adam both used to wear really big baggy clothes. Oh, we're such little dorks. I mean, we're still dorks. We're just big dorks now. This is us at our most raw, most original form, I suppose, way back in 1999. And we really needed photos for our record on Ferret. So we went and used most of these for the layout on the first record. It's funny, I think when we started, I wasn't sure we'd be around for 16 days. Never mind 16 years, I'll never forget. Where we all came from playing with the VFW shows and the crappy pubs. You know, you drive five hours to play for five people. <laughs> Lose five hundred dollars doing it. Uh, we got merch for sale. Uh, second pool table back. Any support you guys give us, we appreciate it, man. It's gonna help us stay in places and eat food on tour. Because we've been broke. We play a show with like ten people, so I appreciate this, man. It's nice. Nice to see you out of here. It's pretty insane. It doesn't feel like sixteen years. We kind of all grew up together, you know. I had known everybody from other bands in the scene, in the Massachusetts scene, Connecticut scene, Rhode Island scene, New York scene. Overcast started in 1991 and ended in 98, so I had seven, eight years experience of meeting bands and playing with bands. And I was already playing with Jesse's old band, Corinne, in Rhode Island. Yeah, we got a show next Friday uh, with Overcast at David. We had played shows together, but we weren't, like, good friends, you know? Um, and same with Adam and Joel, like, just nice guys, but I didn't know them, know them. So the vibe at first was we had a love for music, and that's kind of where it started. The first time I ever saw Adam play in Aftershock, he had invited me down because we were talking about doing a new band. He's either playing drums or bass or whatever for Aftershock. It was his band, and he would play whatever instrument no one was there for. I never really think 
about those days very much. You know, it's like when I was in college. It's crazy to think that was my life before the band. He's just playing blood all over the drum set. And after the set, I walked up to him. I said, that was amazing. And he's like, oh, yeah, I could have done a lot better than that. I said, well, you're the guy then. If you can do better than that, then you're the guy. And that long-haired guitarist that you have on stage, meaning Joel, we need that guy in the band, too. That guy's awesome. And that was kind of the start of Kill Switch right there. So that's the first riff that Adam and Mike ever showed me when we were starting to jam as Kill Switch many years ago. It took a long time to get Jesse. We had probably tried out 15, 16 singers. It just did not make sense at all. We almost threw the whole thing away. But once we found him, we were really excited that we had this team together ready to go. <laughs> Jesse was an integral part of building the personality of our band. Lyrically, there was more of a positivity, not so like, gloom and doom, check us out, we're a metal band, ooh, spooky. photo because it actually captures a moment where I was really constipated on stage. You can see in my face it's quite painful, but I love that there's an artistry behind capturing the constipation. Uh, it actually became a song uh, called Fixational in Darkness, um, where I, I, you know... <laughs> Syracuse. Adam definitely has a flat top in these. And I believe it was the same day that Mike Gitter from Roadrunner came up to check out our first demo that we created for them. That was the year that Roadrunner signed us. And it was definitely the demo that Roadrunner signed us on. I want to thank Mike Gitter for coming down. I want to thank you guys all for showing up. Thank you very much. This is the uh, promo poster for Live Just Breathing. Back when I wore big African beads. I was in spiritual warfare at that time, trying to be a little Rastafarian Christian savior to music. I don't know what I was thinking. This is going to be on a Roadrunner CD. This goes out to our P3 fans out there. During the recording of the Live Just Breathing, Roadrunner had asked us if I could send them some photos of what they were spending their money on. So we took it upon ourselves to photograph some pretty ridiculous stuff. That was our way of just kind of being like, yeah, this is what we're up to in the studio. We've yeah. taken tons of beers and wasting your money. <laughs> In the summer of 2010, we did nothing the rest of that year. We did nothing in 2011. There were a, a lot of um, personal issues with uh, Howard in the band. It got really dark. For about four or five years, the band just seemed on pins and needles and sort of it could have gone in any direction and uh, no one was really super happy with how things were progressing. We were all kind of at each other more than we needed to be. Stress levels were a little higher. It's just kind of a weird situation. I think we all just said maybe the best thing to do is take a break, see where everybody's at in a few months or that turned into a couple of years really. On one hand, we had been at it for so many years in a row. Being apart from each other wasn't the worst thing in the world, but it was clearly too long being apart from each other. I certainly missed it a lot. And I was thinking what a shame it would be if we weren't gonna be able to do this again. I thought the band was completely over. Could have broken up for all we knew. Everybody stayed active musically, at least. For everybody's creative sanity, it was good to have that time. Okay, I'm gonna go do something different for a little bit. I think we'd probably all go nuts if we weren't doing something musically. I started playing with Unearth 
they asked me to record their record, Darkness and the Light, and I did a couple tours with them, and it was really, really fun. I still had the bug to play. I needed to play. So I started Death Ray Vision with Brian Fair and Pete Cortese from my old band, Overcast. Overcast started playing together again. I just needed to be out playing in front of people no matter what. I have a project with Brothers Born. My good friend, Mike, the first record is called Knife Wounds. We wrote that pretty much on that whole Kill Switch Chinese. It's a strange mix of like folky indie stuff with a kind of an 80s twist to it. Adam and Jesse were doing Times of Grace. The Times of Grace record initially stemmed from me getting hurt on tour and having to have uh, emergency surgery. When he was writing the record, I think it was just a way for him, like laying in a hospital bed, not being able to move. Like he had this stuff in his head he needed to get out. I wrote an entire record of music and I wrote started writing some lyrics and I needed help with the lyrics. As I was looking for a job, staring at my failures of my career, he was going through the same sort of like, where's my life going with his back? Like he thought he was done touring. So all that energy combined, Adam and I came together and just totally bonded and became like best friends. With that stuff live and it was such a great rewarding experience. And I was like, hey, you know, Joel, I didn't want to ask you at first because you know, conflict of interest kind of thing, obviously, but. Um... So you want you know you want to do the tours? I just got lazy looking still looking for a guitar player. I'm just like, hey Joel, want to play guitar with me? You're my friend. <laughs> He's like, yeah, okay. Sign me up. I'm sitting around at home, kind of miss hanging out and <laughs> playing music. I think Adam and Joel have a chemistry that is undeniable. <laughs> changed as a person when I was touring I kind of found myself again out there on the road it definitely struck a chord with Jesse he's like you know what I like this way better than bartending in New York or working in an office when Times of Grace finished up its touring cycle that's when we started to put the material together for Kill Switch the cycle of my life of going on tour and getting that high of performing and feeling like I'm doing what I love and then coming home and like facing my failures like it's just been like this for 10 years. We had a lot of music written for the next record. You know, we were hoping that we would have all this stuff ready to go and that we would have Howard back ready to go and then we were gonna move forward. We called up Howard and we were like, hey, come down and check out these songs. We really wanna get together and get your feedback. He was kinda distant and Everybody was really wondering where his, his head was at if he wanted to do it. But I think at that point we kind of knew, we like, you know, I don't think he's really into this. We were just committed to making a record, period. Didn't really know who was going to sing it. That was the problem. <laughs> right at the beginning of the year in 2012, we were absolutely certain and everything was official that Howard was not going to be in the band going forward. Carpet kind of got pulled out. And we're like, what the heck's going to happen here? There's two years or so, we were just kind of in limbo. We didn't know if Howard wanted to do it. And uh, when he finally left, Okay, where are we at now? That was very nerve-wracking, trying to figure out what the next step should be or if we should just call it quits and start something brand new. In my mind, I was like, yeah, this could be the end. Let's give it a shot and see if we can pull something out of the hat and make it work. We all realized that we had a good thing going with Kill Switch, and we all wanted to keep that going. We all thought that we could keep that going. <laughs> It took a while for us to get the press release done for Howard leaving. We didn't want anybody to get thrown under the bus. We didn't want anyone to feel bad. And we didn't want to be one of those bands that attacks members that leave. I have respect for Howard. We love him. And he had some, some personal things that are personal. You know, it's like, I don't want people talking about my personal life on the interwebs. You know, screw that. It's my life. Obviously, want to respect Howard's privacy and um, anything that he wants to talk about is fine, but I don't think that's our place to to talk about. That should be for him. <laughs> our immediate thought was that we're not really sure if this will be okay unless it's Jesse coming back. After Times of Grace, I got a job 
working as a bar back for a Scotch whiskey bar and decided that I was going to learn mixology and become a cool bartender. I grew a mustache out. Like, I was like, this is who I am now. I'm a 30-something-year-old bar back. And that's right around the time I got news that Killswitch was holding auditions. We had auditions in New York that management had set up and said, well, let's just try out everybody you can possibly think of. We had a couple really, really good tryouts, actually. I remember there were several people where I was like, this could work. This is pretty cool. I remember wiping a glass. Somebody came in and recognized me. And I had a moment of like, what's he thinking? Like, you saw me on stage doing this, and then now I'm cleaning the spit out of your glass. And that's when I realized maybe I needed to change. If I wasn't happy in that moment, if I couldn't own what I was doing, then maybe I was doing the wrong thing. He called us back. He's like, I was kidding when I said I wasn't sure. I'm on a commodation. Yeah. I think that call from Jesse was the best thing we could have heard. <laughs> We started out doing like stuff from our lab, just breathing, and it was feeling good, and everyone all smells around, and then Adam's like, let's do some Howard stuff. He had originally said he didn't want to do any Howard stuff, and we said, well, there's no way you can be our singer. Howard has really, really tough shoes to fill. Taking somebody else's music and adding it to my repertoire and making it my own was tough for me in my head at first. It was really important that Jesse find something in the lyrics to connect with Howard's stuff because he wasn't going to go up there and sing a bunch of stuff he didn't believe or he didn't feel something towards. <laughs> The first song that really hit me was Arms of Sorrow. I remember reading the lyrics to that and thinking to myself, I could relate to it. It's about like crawling away and like just being depressed. <laughs> I know that song and dance real well. So that song hit me and I was like, I could sing this song. A lot of guys that tried out were great, but they were you know, obviously trying to sound like Howard. Jesse came in and sang like Jesse. He sang Howard songs like Jesse would sing Howard songs. And I think that's what we liked. And that's what we liked about Howard back in the day too. <laughs> This distance, this dissolution, I cling to memories while falling. I bring and the hope of a new day. Waking in the middle of Like it felt like the band again. It didn't feel like there was somebody different in the band. It just felt like the band. And we left there that day just thinking, all right, we have our singer. And he can pull off stuff he's never been able to pull off before. You know, of course, we were scared being like, dude, are you going to just bail on us again? Are you going to do that again? Don't do that. Don't do that. I think that crossed our minds, but we just we just asked him about it. Say, hey, how do you feel? Like, well, why do you want to do it now? And he didn't then. I sat him down and said, look, guys, <laughs> I feel this. This is great. I think this is something we can do. I won't quit this time. <laughs> I promise. And if I take this on, this is, I understand this is it. Like, I'm going to give everything I got to this. He proved to us beyond a shadow of a doubt that he wanted the job and that he wasn't going to leave us high and dry anymore. My words were, no joke, I would rather die than do that again. I'd rather die than, like, not see this thing through, I'm committing myself. We first announced Jesse's return, all we did was just put a picture of us on the website. Everyone's smiling and having fun because we were having a great time. Who gets a second chance, never mind the third one. So when Jesse came back, I think he was really psyched. There's definitely a fire in everybody's ass. Excited to write and to tour again. Wow, we can still do this. This is amazing. Here you go. Welcome to the band, Jesse. Here's like 15 songs, write lyrics. <laughs> and we're going on tour soon, so finish quickly. So I knew I had a new record. I had to get ready to go on tour. They had already booked Metal Fest. I said to the guys, let's have our first show be Metal Fest. The first show with Jesse back was absolutely madness. Like my head was just spinning with all the events of everything leading up to that. Not just that it was Jesse, but it was the first time we were on stage in almost two years together. All of us were almost teary-eyed going up there like, wow, this is so awesome. And then we're walking out to the song Reunited. <laughs> we had like a little slideshow of all the old stuff playing and it was just totally goofy and overly sappy. Then the kabuki curtain dropped. <laughs> Stage.
stage, it's a blur. I don't remember the show at all. <laughs> and I remember how I felt afterwards, and those bookend feelings were just unbelievable. <laughs> Locked in perfectly and felt as right as it did in the very beginning. As soon as we finished the set, I remember going upstairs to the dressing room and just collapsing, like just mentally and physically exhausted. But like elated, like super happy. Like this is my life now. Wow. After nine years, I, I can't even believe it. It's really strange for me to say that I'm back at Kill Switch Engage, right? It's crazy. I want to thank these four dudes behind me for believing in me and being my best friends, man, for being my brothers. Give it up for these guys. Give it up for these guys, man. I want you guys to be the first to welcome one of my best friends in the entire world. Back. Back because he left before the pussy. Make some fucking noise. But one of my best friends in the world, Tussie Lee. Let's go. I guess it could have worked reintroducing Jesse as a singer with a record immediately, but a little over a year we were sitting on all these songs and we had a tour coming up. Originally we thought we might be able to get it done beforehand, but it didn't work out so well. I remember Jesse hitting a wall for sure. Lost a little bit of momentum with his writing. What have I done to... Oh! <laughs> So we stopped recording his vocals, went on tour with Five Finger Death Punch. And then we did that whole Alive or Just Breathing tour where we did that entire record. And this was actually from uh, the Alive or Just Breathing tour. This is the Seal Seal. <laughs> Played the whole record from start to finish and never done anything like that before. It definitely brought us back for sure. I didn't look at it and go, oh, back in the day this was great. It's like, no, back in the day kind of sucked and now like with this new vigor this new energy we we're able to reapproach this material with more confidence and strength and it was redemption in a way <laughs> Touring with the band and hearing their story and hearing their struggles and learning where they all came from and what's been going on in their lives for 10 years. Seeing how life on the road affected people that I've grown up with, the old friends that have been touring. <laughs> So it went from like me doing this with the lyrics to like everybody. So a lot of the songs are not about me, they're about us. <laughs> None of us should be thought of as anything less than the potential to change the world. These are the days our lives will change and time will not remain. I just think it speaks about all of us. You know, our days here on this earth are, are very few and precious. And to have that potential to, to do whatever you set your mind to, you know, I just kind of wanted to, to write about all of us in that song. I've always loved the way Jesse looks at the world. He's just a passionate dude. The more I get to know him, the more I kind of understand where he's coming from with his lyrics. This is the turning point, the rising of the tide. No fear inside. This is the turning point. Oh, see, I have to like sing it because it just gets like <laughs> I say it wrong. So this is the turning point, the rising of the tide. No fear inside. This is the change that takes the suffering away. No more wasting time. Uh, when I wrote that, I definitely had somebody else in mind. But it works for my life, too. The beauty of Jesse's lyrics is you can probably interpret any song in three or four different ways. Because I'm like, hey, did you write this song about this? He's like, no, it's actually about that. But you could interpret it that way. 
I think it's kind of what makes him such a clever lyricist. I always believed in his lyrics. I've always loved his lyrics. I'd rather call him a poet than a lyricist. All in the time, the shadows will give way to light. The one I connected with the most was the song In Due Time, because it just kind of felt like everything we had gone through. The first single off of Disarmed the Descent was In Due Time. And it actually ended up being the song we got nominated for the Grammy for, which kind of blew my mind. <laughs> coming back having his first record back and like you know song gets a Grammy nomination must have felt good it's always a surprise to get nominated for Grammy and the second time was really cool and the heartache was nominated for the metal performance which is almost like 10 years ago at this point which seems crazy we didn't even believe <laughs> the call for management really like, now that's not true <laughs> You gotta be kidding, everybody's just laughing, like, what? That's ridiculous. Every single one of us had the same reaction of laughter. Disbelief and laughter, like, what? <laughs> totally left field stuff that you never thought would happen, but boy oh boy did it validate everything I was doing to my parents. For me to, like, look at my parents and be like, Grammy nominated, it was like, oh, approval from my parents. Grammys? Bah. Whatever. I freaking got on The Price is Right. <laughs> oh, The Price is Right? Yeah, I was more, I was way more excited about The Price is Right than any stupid Grammy nomination. That's so much more exciting. That is a childhood dream lived. I don't know how this happens. It still seems like a dream. It was not real. Every single morning, first thing in the morning, you'll turn on The Price is Right. Be recording in the studio, he's sitting in front of the console, and there's the little TV with The Price is Right on in the corner. And we had an entire tour that we had Price is Right themed. February 10th, and I had this big plan that he was talking about for weeks. Adam never told us what was gonna happen. He said he signed a contract saying he wasn't supposed to tell anybody what was gonna happen, but that he was gonna take a drink for every prize he won. So we showed up at 10.30 with donuts and beers and cracked beers and started drinking immediately so we could party during the show which was 11 to 12. It was a completely just like drama filled episode for me. Even if it was just in the crowd and I saw him I would have been thrilled. But forget everything else that happened. I mean, it's crazy. I get called down and I lose my mind. I just black out in excitement. It's Adam Dutkiewicz. Come on down. And I'm hanging out in contestants row for the entire show until the last moment we can get on stage and they start the dollar bid. First chick says like 950 and then the guy next to her is like 951 and I tried to throw off the girl next to me by going like nine I skip 952 I just go straight to 953. So blow her mind and it worked. It freaking worked I got out there Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm doing great, man. I, I think I broke things. Uh, don't forget, just stand. Don't worry about that, Mike. We don't need it. You know, he's the last guy to get on stage. And you know it's a car because they didn't do a car yet in the second half. So you know it's a car, and it's a car. And he gets it on the last thing that he pulls. <laughs> Spin the wheel. Beat those people. Nuts. Losing my mind. Each step of the way, I was like, no, he's not going further. And then when he won, we were, we were losing it. I, I was yelling. It was awesome. I wasn't planning on being a game show dominator. I didn't plan on just dominating. I didn't. <laughs> did, did not. That was close, folks. Hunter won box stickers. Jane Heaven Hurt. Amazing. He won $51,833 of the prize today. Not a bad day for Adam. Almost half of what I won, I'm probably going to hold the federal government. I know. Stupid. So I gotta sell. I gotta. Who wants to buy some cars? Please. I need it. The first tour we did over in Europe, we played Download 2012. I was so nervous. Anxiety starting to come over. Like biggest crowd I've ever played in front of in my entire life. It was raining. And then three songs in, the rain stopped. The sun came through the clouds and legit like a spotlight. It was so bright, I could barely even see the audience. And I just stood there and had a moment. And I remember I put my arms out like this and just kind of like looked up. And tears filled my eyes. And I looked down and just grabbed the mic. I was like, what a beautiful day. The rain sucks. The sun's coming out. That's the biggest spotlight we have on the planet, man. And it's out right now. I 
never felt that in my life. I'm like, this is it. Like, that was the moment where I was like, this is amazing. I got this. It was like this dark cloud had lifted. It dissipated, and all of a sudden, the sun was out, and things seemed like a real band again. It seemed like we were all on the same page. We all could see the future, and it looked bright for the first time in a long time. I'll be honest with you, man. The first few tours were just a total love fest. Give it up to these guys behind me. These four guys behind me. Give it up for Kill Supreme. I couldn't have been happier being back in the room with those guys. And it was a lot of drunken love fests. <laughs> to a bunch of old jaded guys. I've seen a million faces and I rocked them all. <laughs> We've been to Japan like eight or nine times. If he was going there for the first time, we would see things through Jesse's eyes, pointing out all these things that we had never even really noticed before. This is my first passport. I got when I first joined Killswitch, planning to travel the world. That never happened, but I did go on a press tour with Joel in 2002. So I got a few stamps on here. And here's my passport for Killswitch Engage now. Which I had to buy extra pages, and this thing is almost full. You know what? I realize that we've never played this thing before, ever. Ever. It is strange to say that after 16 years, we still have firsts that are happening. First time to China. Welcome to Shanghai. First time to Korea, and a bunch of Southeast Asia dates. Whoa, whoa. We recently finally made it to Mexico which doesn't seem like it should have taken this long. It's pretty close. <laughs> Just made it down here, which is pretty neat. South Africa, pretty awesome. Love to go back. Oh my God, it's amazing. Dude, it's just Instagram gold. <laughs> Look at this bird! <laughs> These ostrich were ridiculous. Oh, oh my god, yeah. You <laughs> freaked out this kid. <laughs> the big bird went after a little kid. It was insane. <laughs> this kid's crying. <laughs> it's always a good time with a tremendously oversized bird attacks a small human. <laughs> to go there and to experience the culture and to like get two feet from a lion, to get into a steel cage and go diving with great white sharks, all that stuff was so insane. Days off were nice on the international tours. We had a couple of cool days in South America. It was our first time going to Rio, did a little sightseeing. Got my picture with Big Jesus. Me, Luke, our sound guy, Justin, and Mikey, my guitar tech, climbed that mountain. I got up there like 45 minutes before all of them. Joel took the bus up the mountain. <laughs> it's all about stepping outside of the dressing room and the bus and the bar and experiencing a little bit of a culture. And it's one of the joys of traveling the world and being able to experience that kind of stuff because that's life-changing moments like that. But the last time we went to Alaska, we went out in this like 20 miles snowmobile thing out to some glacier. We were all so sore the next day because we were just going nuts in these snowmobiles. You can't move. Your back's so sore. You're like, how are we going to get through this show? <laughs> you got to hug a koala. It was, it was pretty awesome. Had a group shot with the koala. We were all being real tough. And then Mike photoshopped corpse paint on the koala. <laughs> that's what you do with a koala. You, you act tough. You're pretty fierce creatures. <laughs> like hiking we were in Austria but that was one of the first things we did with Jesse back in the band it was like well cool let's do a band photo on top of a mountain this is cool yeah that was horrifying I don't like heights at all like hiking up there that's no big deal I'm still standing on earth the whole time but getting on one of those like cable car things that's not fun at all we all kind of enjoy hanging out and at any chance we all go out to dinner when we can and hang out and go out for drinks and everybody has their little things they do throughout the day and then reconvene at some point in the evening a typical day you would find Joel sleeping 
Joel is the guy who just spends his entire time in the bunk sleeping or watching Ancient Aliens. Netflix is like his best friend. He likes to relax a lot. I'm very jealous of his sleeping skills. He'll stay in his bunk for like 16 hours. It's insane. I don't know how any human does that. Guys want a treat? Can you sit? Sit? That's a good boy. Hey, can you sing for us? <gasps> sing nice. That's pretty good. How about a high five? Yeah. Can I have a kiss? I've always been kind of a homebody. I like hanging out with my friends and family and stuff and nerding out and playing guitar. Anytime I see him with a guitar off stage, I just want to sit next to him and just drink and watch him play because he's an incredible player. I don't always pick it up and play metal riffs anymore. I've kind of tried to branch out and do different things and play a lot more acoustic guitar and play banjo or mandolin or lap steel. I can sit in a room and just listen to music for 10 hours and not get bored. He's a legend, man. I'll get up to go to the bathroom on the tour bus at like three in the morning and Joel will be listening to like country music or something. He'll just look over and be like, Uncle. And I'm like, you know, underwear on, I just need to pee, I just need to go back to bed. And a couple of nights he's convinced me to come out and have a beer. And we call that getting jeweled. Because once you have that one beer, it turns into two beers, and before you know the sun is coming up. Whenever Joel stays up very late on the bus by himself, drinking, we'll wake up and there'll just be a drawing of one of the band members. I drew this one for Adam D to commemorate his Price is Right celebration. I drew some pictures of the dogs for my wife here. This one's a little banged up, and that's Lieutenant. This is our other dog now. His name's Bozo. Jess calls him Boop. boop a loop So, a 12 beer later rendition of Bozo. <laughs> After about three, four in the afternoon, the bear arises from his cave. I like to try to walk around a bit and see some stuff. I want to go and get something cool to eat or I'm vegetarian, so I'll try to search out a cool vegetarian spot with Josh, who's vegan. Mike looks at his computer a lot. I know that. <laughs> like, a lot. When we show up to a hotel, he's the first one in using the Wi-Fi, working on a project listening to Howard Stern or listening to some like hardcore or metal and working. I'm still that guy that wants to do everything himself, graphic design and doing all the covers for Killswitch and a lot of the flyers and a lot of the merch and stuff like that. And it is easy to shoot photos of pretty much anything, photos that have taken on the road, things that I think are gonna make really cool backgrounds, like the scrapes right here, or this line right here was taken from a really disgusting club floor. Grime, dirt, big machinery, engines, rust, just really gross stuff makes for the best textures, so that's what I use. I just nonstop shoot when I'm on the road, it's many different things as I possibly can. My mindset dictates whether I like being away from home or not, but if I'm off tour, I'd rather be at my house. I could spend a couple weeks here without leaving if I didn't have to get food. I don't mind, I like it here. I think it's fun. All my stuff's here. Oh. <laughs> I cook, I cook almost every day. Something about it is very therapeutic, I love it. That's the little things that really make me happy when I get home from tours, like going grocery shopping. I like to go to the market and just take my time and like you know, pick up produce and look at it. I love that. It's funny, I get emotional. Like my first, <laughs> my first time grocery shopping when I come home, it's an experience. I almost feel like I'm on a cooking show right now. The Awkward Chef. <laughs> The thing I miss most when I'm on tour is anonymity, being a sort of normal, regular, everyday person. So when I'm home, I have a lot of alone time, whether it's here in my apartment or in the woods. I just like peace and quiet and clear my mind. <laughs> Sometimes when we're, if we're parked kind of in the middle of nowhere and there are woods around, he'll just go off in the woods for a few hours. It's very hippie-ish, but that's what makes Jesse Jesse being that guy who goes off and does his own things or wants to experiment and explore. <laughs> share an experience with somebody. Get to the top of a mountain, crush a beer. It's like, I conquered you. Smash. Jesse and I are both outdoorsy. If there's a chance for us to get to a beautiful beach, we'll do it. We'll go swimming. I'll drive, I'll drive. I'll drive. Oh, no. Nice to meet you guys. Adam, I promise I'll get hammered at your funeral. <laughs>
I think Adam's the most adventurous because he runs, so he always wants to get out and, and go for a run somewhere. Every morning you will not know where Adam is, and then he'll show up sweaty and soaking wet, and you're like, oh, I guess he took a run somewhere. You never really know what Adam's going to do at any given moment. It's great to be out on the road and see things and do things and play shows, and it's also great to be home, to be with your friends and family, be a human. Being able to have a bed to sleep in and a toilet to dump in is like, I'll never, ever take those for granted. Steve! Steve! Sit! Sit! Do not lie down. Oh, you're such a dummy. Get up! Good boy. Now lie down. Stay. Stay. Now crawl. 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 The contrast of who he is off tour and who he is on tour, it's almost like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation. He's like the Tasmanian devil on tour. He's in rage mode most of the time. But I love him. I'm sorry to everyone that was at the Phoenix show where Adam put the horse head on his head. This is before the show, the meet and greet. See, there's people waiting to meet Adam. Instead, we're greeted with a horse head. Literally, everyone loses their mind because all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden I am now a horsey man. I'm a horsey man now. This is insane. Look at this. And then I do my backup vocals. My last serenade probably did not sound very good that night, but man, was that funny. The only way I can get to the microphone is if the horse ate the mic. Because the nose comes out foot in front of my face, so the horse would just have to eat the mic. And I'm sure the audio quality was just stellar on it. Because it's just, you know, like, it's just surrounded by plastic. So I probably saw it like this. And, uh, and I don't even think I sang because I was just laughing. When I'm on stage, it's like party. I'm a frat kid. I want to drink beer and throw things and smash it and scream at people and just jump off walls. And that's what you do at shows, right? Funny story. My guitar is already broken. So, can I just party with you guys for now until I fix it? to see how people just assume I'm who I am on stage, off stage all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. Welcome see, to the Kill Switch Engage you Power Hour, hour right, sorry, Kill Switch Engage. Power Hour is the hour before we go on, where we drink our faces off. <laughs> <laughs> in the way of this sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It helps just not think <laughs> just things happen without having to. It's the easy way out, but that doesn't help me. Nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink until we're done playing and my job is over. But I'm the only one that shares that opinion. <laughs> sober on stage. Days off, though. My time to shine. Days off, he'll start drinking at 11, and he turns into a crazy person by the afternoon, like loud. When I get home, I just lay around with my cats. That's pretty much it, and it's perfect. Justin will venture out sometimes, but it's mostly for bars. Justin golfs when he can, brings his clubs in the row with him. Justin's a big sports fanatic. All he does is sports. I've kind of become a tremendous sports fanatic as well. We love to go to baseball games on days off. And I'm trying to knock off all the ballparks. So when I got to go to Dodger Stadium, I was really excited. And the fact that there's a minor league baseball team named after a Simpsons episode joke makes me extremely happy because I'm a gigantic Simpsons fan. So for years now, I've been dying to go to an Albuquerque Isotopes game. We finally got to go to one and decided to lay face down in the grass for a little while while there was a baseball game on. We've actually gone to a game in Japan too. That was really, really insane. You could eat like squid entrails and they had weird like fish treats there instead of your normal American hot dogs. 
We had a day off on the 4th of July in Kansas City, and we went to a Royals game. We were probably 30 beers deep, and then Adam just got into a screaming match with a girl. <laughs> it was funny, this, like, tiny little girl, like, come up and just screaming, like, ah! Like, oh! I'm just going like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> kept meticulous journals ever since he started the band of every single show that we've played with him. He'll write down the set list and then write maybe a paragraph long explanation of the show. So some days it would be not much of anything, other days there would be a lot. Or if we had a day off where we did something particularly cool, I would write a lot about it. So whenever we were like, oh, was that the night that this happened? Or he'll just go to the book and be like, yup. On this last touring cycle, we hit Justin's thousandth show with the band, which was kind of a big moment. It made us all realize, wow, we've been doing this for a while. It was kind of neat. October 12th, 2013, Santos Party House in New York, New York. It's my first show back since missing an entire tour because of falling off my stupid bike and breaking my clavicle. So in the summer of 2013, we had this big tour of Asia, and we were going to places like the Philippines we'd never been to before. And two weeks before that, I fell off my bike. He doesn't remember falling off his bicycle. And he broke his clavicle beside a bunch of places. So I went to the hospital. I wasn't even thinking about this. I was nervous about my concussion, and reality set in, and I started to get worried about long-term playing. Like, am I going to be able to move that again? Once I knew what was happening, it really hurt. And then once they did the surgery, it hurt a lot. He had all these metal pins and stuff in his shoulder, so he couldn't really do anything for a couple of months. And we had two weeks to figure out what we are going to do, either cancel the tour or, like, get somebody to fill in. It's this hand, so it's my snare drum hand. So really, I could, if I could just do this, and you can just crank the snare drum up really loud, you know, maybe it's, it could still work and just modify fills or whatever. That was... Uh, fool's dream. Jordan from As I Lay Dying at the time, who's now in a band called Woven War, was able to fill in. He learned the songs in a week. I remember Jordan just being really, really excited to just get away from home and get out there and play some music again. Yeah, him and Justin are my good buddies too, so I think it meant a lot to Justin that he stepped in. And it was really fun to have him on the road. Like, he's got a really unique perspective on music and what he went through with his band. I knew Jordan was doing a great job, but I just I hated it. I hated not being there. It was really an irresponsible thing, and I was just letting everyone down, so I just I hated it. And the first time we ever played together was on stage in Japan, Fuji Rock. I'm like, okay, <laughs> high fives, everybody. <laughs> Hoping for the best. Thankfully, after that tour, we had like a month and a half break until the next thing. So at that point, he had enough time to recover. I kept talking to my doctor about it, and he was kept telling me not to play drums. And then we were getting close to this other tour, and it was getting really close. And then at one point, he said, um, yeah, it's looking pretty good, but I would give it another, whatever, a week or so, and it, I just finally said, I, ha I have to play. changes when somebody's not there and somebody's filling in. You can kind of figure out how to do the songs and you can figure out how to get the show together and you can figure out how to make it sound okay, but that's like an hour a day. There's 23 other hours that your guy is not there with you all day long, so that's like the worst part about it. of being in this band is being able to travel the world with your buddies and live a dream. You get to hang out with your friends every day. We hire friends, so we just have a bus filled with people who know each other well. Josh has been with us for God knows how many years, and I've known Josh since like middle school, known for a long time. <laughs> you guys give it up for our crew. That's Mikey right there. Jay, get on the drum set. Josh over there. Alan, the tour manager, and Luke, our sound guy. They work their asses off. Everyone in Kill 
Killswitch is definitely family. I would 100% call Killswitch my brothers, for sure. We've been through a lot together, and some things are even so hard to discuss that just looking at the guys, we have that sort of mentality of unspoken words. We've been doing it together for so long. It's just like tried and true at this point. Like we know we can count on each other to make music together that we're proud of. We all got each other's backs, you know? I think with any good band, that's why it works. There's a chemistry between the band members and something you can't describe. <laughs> with playing with those guys. When I get out on stage, it's really those guys that pump me, not my playing. And the fans actually clapping that gives me that charge that I used to get when I was a kid. <laughs> different now when I get on stage versus when we started. It's not so much the music sometimes that drives me now, because we've played our songs a million times. The things that really drive me on stage, it's always the kids, it's always the crowd. It's inspiring to see people having a good time. And the best shows we've ever had are because of the audience. The audience feeds that fire. People who come and actively show up to those shows, pay that ticket price, buy a t-shirt, Go to meet and greets. Those people are the reason we're still going. The fans, the fans, the fans. Like without those people supporting us, there would be no Killswitch. We wouldn't have a career. it's a daily thing but for everyone at the show it isn't it's a thing that happens when we get to the cities once a year or once every two years or once every five years I feel all of that when I go out to play for everybody I want to make sure that it's worth it for them It's crazy like how many changes this band has been through and how many times the rug could have been totally pulled out from under our feet and we managed to stay standing. It's kind of like, I feel pretty thankful for that. With Jesse Lee, with the Howard situation, with Jesse coming back, and his back surgeries, this band should not be together, but we've persevered. And I think it's because of the members having that close-knit unity, that friendship. It's much like being in a relationship with a bunch of girls, except it's a bunch of guys that act like a bunch of girls. The divorce rate's pretty high. play music, but I didn't really ever think it would turn into, okay, this is my life, I play in a touring band, that's my job. <laughs> I never really planned on that. Everybody wants to put their stamp on the world in some way, I guess, so if we can do it through music, <laughs> I guess that would be a good legacy to have. <laughs> because it was fun and I wanted to be in a band that toured because that's what the drummers I like did and somehow it all happened and it's continuing to happen. It seems like the luckiest lottery you could win. Success for me is simple, just making people happy. To see people get enjoyment from music the way I get enjoyment from music. I love music. I love the fact that I've been given the chance to be able to do that for my life, everything I do. It's awesome. <laughs> more important 
important than being a performer. And why I say that is because the only reason I am a performer because I was a fan. How can you not be a fan of something that gave you life, that gave you your career? Like, if it wasn't for hardcore music, I wouldn't even be here. I think at a young age it saved my life. I'm playing in a metal band for my job. That's the dream. <laughs> Drunk history in full effect, man. <laughs> <laughs> 